but I'm not a velocity banking expert. Denzel is. So, uh, so I thought Denzel, maybe if you can start going through how you address the typical standard objections and then where appropriate, I might bring in specific comments that I've gotten on my channel that you might want to address. Definitely. So first things first, giving people a history lesson here, book to read. Okay. This is where it started. This book is called Own Your Home Year Sooner and Retire Debt-Free by a guy named Harj Gill. This is the guy, the, the founder of the Velocity Banking concept. He originally named it Mortgage Acceleration, right? He has a company called Speed Equity. If you read his book, you're going to see the journey he took to bring this strategy to bank and it started in australia and then he eventually brought it to the united states once it hit the united states there were many other people that caught wind of it other entrepreneurs other business owners and decided to also promote this and now fast forward 2024 here we are where every day people like myself caught on to the strategy and were like you know what i want to teach the community i want to touch certain people and, and help people that have tons of debt how they can incorporate this strategy into their finances that, that makes sense for them. So that's kind of giving you where this thing comes from, the history behind it. It's pretty cool. And then you kind of track where, where it goes today. And then you find someone that is a, is a coach, is an expert that you resonate with, that you trust, that you like. And having that accountability is going to help you definitely have more success with the strategy instead of you trying to do it on your own by just watching a few videos. I think that's where a lot of people make a ton of mistakes. If they watch four videos, they think they know what they're doing and they go out, they get a HELOC, and then they come back, they're like, oh shoot, I got the wrong debt tool. I got the wrong line of credit. I got a super high rate when I could have got a super low rate. Uh, there, were, there were steps that I missed. Most of those people end up on my channel because they start searching how to do this or when does this make sense? Or, and all of my videos are catered to the who, what, when, where, why, how of Velocity Banking without even trying to like sell them anything on the back end. It's just giving them all the tools, all the pregame work needed to even get started, right? So with that, that's our baseline. Now, let me take it to the whiteboard and just show you guys my belief system around Velocity Banking. This really, I think, helps both sides. The person that is pro-Velocity Banking, anti-Velocity Banking, and even in between. Okay, so some key details I laid out here is kind of like my way of thinking as I address this strategy. This was not how I always thought when I first started making my videos. So if you're watching this now and then you go back and watch me do a video five years ago, this isn't going to be consistent. You're going to see a conflict. So I'm just letting you know that in advance. This is me learning as now a 28-year-old. When I first started making YouTube videos at 22, 23, okay, different mindset. And after this is after working with over a thousand plus people on a one-to-one -one basis with their personal finance. This is what has drawn me to this conclusion, right? So right at the top, VB stands for velocity banking and DS stands for debt snowball. This is what most people know as it relates to paying off debt is debt snowball. That's all they know, right? Most people just know that. There's debt avalanche, there's cash flow index, and there's velocity banking. Those are the four most popular ways of eliminating debt. And a bonus would be infinite banking is another way of eliminating debt. But for now, without including an asset, without including another, say, product, if we're just looking at someone's four major numbers, income, expense, debt, and cash flow, your four main strategies is debt snowball, debt avalanche, cash flow index, velocity banking. Now, what I've drawn to this conclusion here, my way of thinking is velocity banking and debt snowball together actually work best. So I used to do a lot of this, velocity banking versus debt snowball. So it, it creates a mindset of throw this out to bring this in. Whereas now in 2024 and really the last year or so and onward, it's more so, wait a minute, when I meet someone for the first time, they're doing this already, and then they, they get introduced to this, Velocity Banking. I'm simply saying, hey, both of these things can actually complement each other. So we don't have to throw out that snowball to do Velocity Banking. In fact, we can keep that snowball and implement Velocity Banking when it makes sense, or they can be in conjunction. They can complement each other. That snowball can be a great pregame, preliminary 
strategy before you jump into velocity banking to optimize the results of you getting out of debt faster. And then once you've fully optimized and maximized the strategy of velocity banking, there may come a point in time in your in your debt, elimina debt elimination strategy where that snowball no longer makes sense. Uh, uh, velocity banking no longer makes sense. So you turn it off. You've already got the lead. You're already beating the guy that is just doing that snowball. So you got a lead. Maintain the lead by simply turning off velocity banking, turning on debt snowball, making extra payments. You're going to get out of debt faster than the person that just did velocity banking or just did debt snowball. This yeah, took and I think years to figure just the, that out. <laughs> right. And I think the thing um, with debt snowball, which I mean, we probably don't want to take the big too much time on that, but um, is that I think people look at it and say from a numbers perspective it's going to take you longer to pay off debts if you do debt snowball but this is where i'll give credit to dave ramsey you know dave ramsey understands the psychology of being in debt that it's not about the numbers right mm -hmm. it's more about your ability to execute right and so debt snowball gives you the early satisfaction of completely paying off a debt sooner and that provides positive momentum right and so, yeah, if we were debt reduction robots, then debt snowball wouldn't make sense because we'd end up, it'd take us longer and we'd pay more in interest, but we're not debt reduction robots, right? Correct. So we always have to acknowledge um, with any financial strategy, the huge psychological component It's not just about the numbers, right? Absolutely. And as much as you or I, we may try to live our lives on a spreadsheet or even on a whiteboard, when life happens, it just throws everything off. So again, back to this, this point of how these things come together, I think will also help with the psychology of you not having to compete, right? Like, oh, if I, if I do this wrong, then, uh, you know, I'm going to be let down or it's like, I should have just stayed over here. Or if I stay over here, knowing that I could have done better over here, it creates this whole mountain of stress that really is unnecessary, right? right. So the, the next point is velocity banking does not always work. That snowball always work so the last what 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 that simply means what what i'm getting at and what i think a lot of some some people just blindly overlook is the extra research and homework one can take to find the best banking product for their personal financial situation so many people are applying for helocs credit cards and PLOCs at big banks that do the most amount of marketing and have the most amount of branch. And I'm the biggest advocate for going to a local credit union bank, not-for-profit bank, where you're gonna get better rates, better tools, better terms, right? You just don't see them marketing. You have to go to page two of Google or scroll down Google to actually see those banks. Whereas the sponsored banks are, are right in front of your face, right? And because they spent all that money in marketing, they have to make up for it, what? In higher rates, higher closing costs, higher fees, right? So the person that goes and gets a home equity line of credit at an 11% interest rate and try to pay off a 4% car loan, there, you, it's like, ugh, we could have done, we could have got a five, 6% HELOC. So the gap is that much smaller in conjunction with a 0% credit card with 0% balance transfer fee and did much better in eliminating that 4% car loan, right? Or that 5.5% uh, personal loan or mortgage, whatever the case may be. So there, by just taking an extra 5, 10 minutes of research and due diligence can not only save you a bunch of money, but you not be in a position where you're forcing the strategy to work in your favor, right? So that's, that's huge. So velocity banking does not always work, but that snowball always work. So therefore, my next point, that snowball is a measurement. What I have come to realize that snowball is actually a measurement tool that, that we can use for velocity banking success, right? And understanding that not every tool works, so look for the best terms and rates as it relates to velocity banking. Please don't force the strategy to work and always run the numbers. And if the only time you wouldn't have to quote unquote run the numbers is if the rate of your debt tool, HELOC, HELOC credit card, business line of credit is less than the debt that you're trying to pay off, right? So higher than I think you meant to say, right? Uh, oh yeah, higher, right? So if you have a, if you have a HELOC and it's at 
eight and a half percent, which is right, which is prime right now. So if you have an eight and a half percent HELOC and you have anything higher than eight and a half percent or even identical to eight and a half percent, a loan, anything, any other debt, it's mm -hmm. an automatic win. You shift it right. in here, it's an automatic win, right? So you could make the argument of, oh yeah, I don't really have to run the numbers on that. I still mm -hmm. would, personally, I still would, you know, draw right. it all out. But you're definitely going to get a better result. Now, the, the, the mindset part is huge here because even if everything looked perfect with Velocity Banking, what we have to recognize, and I think this is where the marketing of content creators like myself may forget to do or, or talk about is the level of difficulty that you're adding compared to debt snowball. Debt snowball is as simple as line your debts up from smallest to greatest and pay the lowest one and work your way down. Done, I don't have to think, it's automatic. And it's just a matter of me being a good steward over my money, making sure that I have a positive cash flow each and every month. And I'm dedicating. Hey it Denzel, uh, I'm small, just seeing that. myself on the on the camera. Oh, you are. You wanna switch it. Forgive me, forgive me. Let me do this real quick. Yeah. So boom. Having that strong mindset to be able to incorporate this strategy, I think, would improve whatever yes. you draw out on your whiteboard or on an Excel or on a software. The human factor here is what. I believe really takes the concept of velocity, creating velocity in your finances to a whole nother level that it's really hard to actually predict that in an Excel spreadsheet or, or software on a whiteboard. Very, very difficult. So right. when I'm, and that's where, go ahead. that's where Denzel, someone like Denzel, a coach becomes super important. He can help you with that. He can help you achieve better results than you could on your own. Cause you can in theory, in theory, do it on your, on your own. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I recently recorded a video with DeAndre Clayton on the psychology of money. Um, and we, we talked a lot about this, about building a plan that has high tolerance for error, that when things happen, when life inevitably happens, it's not going to blow a hole in your plan. Right. And you're not going to feel like, oh, I failed, man. I'm never going to get this done. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to understand, okay, that was, we had, uh, we had accounted for that. We had tolerance in here for that. And we just adjust and we keep moving forward, right? Absolutely. So that's kind of like my, my stance whenever I talk to someone that's new to the strategy or they're just a flat out hater of the strategy. And I'm like, I'm with you, dude. Like you, you hate velocity banking so much. There's times where I don't like velocity banking at all for a certain case study that I'm working on with a client because at the end of the day, I'm primarily a financial coach, consultant, strategist first. I have my coaching hat on first and then I, I dip into my toolbox and I may pull out infinite banking over velocity banking for that specific client. I may hide infinite banking right now, pull out velocity banking, show that to them. I may hide both of them for right now and I just say, look, let's start here. You are in a position where you don't know your numbers. You can't clearly tell me how much you spend on gas, groceries, um, eating out, dining out, you can't clearly tell me these things. You don't know where your money's going. How can I possibly reach into this toolbox and give you an amazing tool for you to use in your own home? You're gonna end up hurting yourself or hurting someone else. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to my tools real quick. I'm gonna give you something very easy to work with, a simple hammer and nail type strategy. This is what we need to target, your personal finances. Let's just simply know where we're at. Let's just have awareness. I, I, I have a, a client I'm working with uh, awesome young lady. She uh, is, you know, out of the military. Before we even started Velocity Banking, for the first, I want to say, two months uh, of working together, it was just debt snowball. It wasn't just debt snowball, but it was also like proper financial stewardship, identifying where our leaks are. She had a leak, a major leak in eating out. Right, so she would go to work, she would eat out a lot, and she had a desire of wanting to. Um, you know, improve her health. So I'm like, what's the value of that? Like, like what happens to you when you eat out? How do we create scenarios in your life where you don't have the temptation to eat out? Is that meal prep? Is that just identifying the emotions that come with eating out? Like, what are the pros of you eating out? Right? So it's like, we're not even discussing velocity right now. I'm just like talking to her because 
I know that with that specific client, there's a $500 leak, let's just say per month in eating out. If I can address that and put 500 more consistent dollars back into her economy without even introducing Velocity, by the time we get Velocity Banking going, I'm off to the races with this, with this particular client. While we're recovering cash flow, then I'm saying with that, we're just gonna make this extra payment towards this card for now, right? And then once this is done, we'll go to the next card. And once that's done, we'll go to the next card. And then we're going to give our money purpose. If there's any excess, we don't know what to do with it. We're gonna declare that we're gonna give more or save more, right? So we might do something like that. Builds up our confidence even more. I'm sleeping better at night. I'm getting to work on time early. I'm performing better at work. If I perform better at work, boom, potential raise. People see me in the company, I can rise up quicker. So I'm like, there's so many preliminary steps, pregame work that I just take the stance on where it's not like, I'm not creating content that velocity banking is so easy, anyone can do it, right? Uh, I don't wanna be a Geico commercial here, right? So easy a caveman <laughs> can do it, right? It's like, no, I, I don't believe that. I do believe that there is some complexity to this and we must address it. If that. it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Everyone exactly. would be doing it. It's exactly. No problem. Bro, you wouldn't need Denzel Rodriguez. You could just hire a robot, write a software program, done. But done. No problem. Right. No problem. And that's just not how humans work. <laughs> Right. We're social right. beings. We need interaction, right? So, well, I don't know. I, I'm pretty introverted, so I don't think I need any social interaction. <laughs> <laughs> Look at what uh, we're doing. Very right little, now. <laughs> very little, very little social interaction. Yeah, um, absolutely. So let's let's dive into some objections that you have seen on on your channel. Now that we've given a landscape for people to operate by where it's like, all right, these are these are some like how can I disagree with this? Like even if I don't like velocity banking, it's like I almost can't disagree with what's being said here so far. Right. So it's like boom, I've i I'm in the room with you. We're sitting, we're having coffee, we're breaking bread, we're having a conversation. We haven't yet debated just yet. So now let's let's dive into some debatable things, controversial you know, objections that come up with the strategy. So this is from um, one of my videos, and these are some of the objections I've been getting. So let's start with this one, because I like talking about the, I don't want to get necessarily into a bunch of numbers on this video. Let's look at uh, some objections that are not based on numbers, because uh, DeAndre and I went through a lot of numbers addressing some of these, and the, I think that sometimes just confuses the audience. Um, yeah. But, so we're talking about risk. So he says, <clears throat> Um, and this is from my answering velocity banking answering objections part three with DeAndre Clayton. You ask, what is the extra risk? Well, for starters, HELOC rates are subject to increase, a risk which is non-existent with fixed rate mortgages. So here specifically, he's talking about replacing your mortgage with a first seen HELOC. Okay. Right. I just want to be clear that is a use case for velocity banking. That is not necessarily velocity banking per se. That is a use case that may make sense. For some people. Yes, rates could also decrease, but we are talking risks. Secondly, other HELOC conditions such as total amount could be changed by the bank. Thirdly, to echo your psychology point, having a reserve of money handy can be risky for some people as it will be hard for them to resist the temptation to use it and spend it on the latest gadgets or whatever. So those are kind of three different points and he's trying to make the yeah. point that it's riskier to use a, in this example, a first lien HELOC. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not a fixed rate. Uh, the bank could change the amount of credit you're given, the, your line of credit. Um, and having access to a pile of money could be a risk for peop for some people. Yep. So it's three, three kind of objections. Absolutely. So I agree with everything Thomas just said. So shout out to Thomas there in, in the comment section. So as someone... Yes, that thank you. Thank you for your comment, Tom. Thomas. Yeah. So as someone that is pro-velocity banking here, what I'm gonna absolutely agree with is yes, the, the HELOC could be shut down in a worst case scenario, frozen, locked up, which just becomes the rate can change because it's not fixed, although you can find fixed rate HELOC. So if you yes. wanted to yes. have some level of consistency with a, a home equity line of credit, and you're looking at variable versus fixed, the advantage of variable is the opportunity for the rate to go down. That's really about it, the rate to go down. With the fixed, you can project the next five years of that fixed rate, three years, whatever it may be. 
So you're able to have an easier projection when it comes to a fixed rate HELOC. So not to say that fixed rate HELOCs don't exist, they're out there, right? And so that is an option, okay? And to Thomas's point, yes, I would, I would lean with him that there is a good amount of people that even I work with, even clients, I have many clients that are not doing velocity banking right now. And they still hire me, We're still, I'm still coaching them because it's not just about velocity banking. There's a lot of content out there that makes it seem like velocity banking is the god of all you know, debt elimination strategies. It's the supreme. And you could make an argument that maybe, right? In, in, in certain mm -hmm. situations, mm -hmm. you could totally make the argument for that. But there are so many people that do not have the financial capacity, literacy, education, discipline, and history, money, and especially lump sums of it. So if I'm dealing with a mother of right. four, if I'm dealing with a mother of four and she's 45 years old, and all she's ever known was debt from her parents. And then when she got married and she married into debt, she came with debt, he came with debt, and they've been in debt ever since. And now the kids got debt because they're in college. And then to show her velocity banking, and then to say, hey, you've got two, three, four hundred grand built up in your property in equity. If we get a two, three, four hundred thousand dollar home equity line of credit and consolidate all your debt and recover cash flow and it's gonna be great and all amazing and have all this increase in cash flow. We're only gonna need a hundred from the four. So she still has 300 grand available. I'm not in their house. I'm not hanging out with them day in and day out. So if another guru like me comes along in their feed and promotes an, a real estate investment strategy that costs 250K and they have 300 available and they don't have the principles, the rules of leverage locked down, and they're trying to do this strategy and invest and create cash flow and create wealth and do infinite banking and do all these things. I have seen it happen time and time again, where to Thomas's point, they do get the gadgets. They do buy the things. They do do the bathroom, right? They renovate this. They, they just keep spending money because they haven't taken the time to experience of not having enough in the sense of not leveraging for a period of time, even though they've been living their whole life paycheck to paycheck. The difference mm -hmm. is the difference is prior to them living their whole lives paycheck to paycheck, that was normalcy. That was their normal state of mind. There was no coaching involved. There was no accountability involved. It was just husband, wife, kids, coworkers, friends, money is taboo. It doesn't get discussed in the church. It doesn't happen at the dinner table. It doesn't happen at the office. It doesn't happen at the friends giving, the friends out, it, it, it doesn't happen. Then they get on YouTube because they, they get to a point where they're so frustrated. Mama four is frustrated of being in debt all her life. She does not want her kids to live the way she lives. So now she goes to YouTube, boom, finds Logan, finds Denzel, finds the Quack brothers, finds all these like, oh my God, what's going on, okay? From this point on, if we, the content creators, are not careful on how we educate and how we coach this mom before, what will happen is we'll dump this whole new way of thinking on her, which creates abundance mindset, which is great, creates opportunity, which is awesome. We give her that $400,000 HELOC that she's been spending all these years just paying down on her, on her mortgage and naturally the property appreciated over time. We could set her back tremendously to Thomas's point. If I give her a $400,000 right. HELOC, most likely this mom of four will probably pay off some debt. She'll probably do the right things initially. Now she gets to experience for the first time the freedom of having an extra whole paycheck at the end of the month left over. Was not there prior, hadn't been there for decades, and now it's there all of a sudden in a flash. It happened so fast. The money's there, right, Logan? It's like, and yeah, you could think naturally, yeah. okay, we're on the, we're on fire. Mm -hmm. Boom. Wife said we need to do the kitchen. You know, mm -hmm. I got to do the gutters. I got to replace the gutters. I got to do the Parkinson's roof. law. Parkinson's law. Boom, 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 boom. Denzel, I don't know what happened. You know, the kids, we had to take them on a vacation. We had to been on vacation in 10 years. And we start making excuses and, oh, it's only this much. And now it went from 150 to 2, 250 to 3. All of a sudden, where all the cash flow go? So this is why point, it is. I totally agree with him. If yeah, this is why. Like me, right? Sorry, if I'm dealing with someone like me that has pre-existing discipline, has gone through Dave Ramsey, 
seven baby steps three, four times, is giving to the church, is uh, consistently tithing, is consistently saving, is contributing to their 401k, 10, 15, 20% of their, uh, their paycheck, and they're still cash flow positive, and they have these disciplines already set, and they want acceleration, they want velocity, they're not worried about those risks because they're not gonna max out their HELOC. They know how to leverage properly. They're gonna become an ally of the bank, not a liability to the bank. The only way the HELOC gets shut down on you in today's environment is when you become a liability to the bank. And even in the event that the bank gets swallowed up, becomes insolvent or bankrupts itself, a bigger bank's gonna buy them out. You're gonna have a different name, okay? You log in a different portal, it's gonna look different. The HELOC's still gonna be there, right? And even if, okay, the, the HELOC reduces on you, or gets frozen on you. I just go to a different bank. I mean, there you go, right? So let's just say I'm doing velocity banking, blah, 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 blah. And I, you know, if you're a velocity banking practitioner, here's another assumption here, but this is implied in this particular world. If you're doing velocity banking, you're doing infinite banking, chances are you're politically involved in the marketplace, the economic marketplace. You're paying attention to global markets. You're paying attention to stock market. You're reading articles, you're not just watching Netflix. Like you're, you're aware of what's going on. You know the status of your bank, the healthiness of it. If you start to see banks uh, start consolidating again, which they have been the last few years and banks getting bought out and you're staying up to date with this stuff and you listen to content, content creators like myself and Logan and many others and you foresee your bank maybe not looking too healthy, you can always go to a different bank. You do not have to display loyalty. We can go to another bank stronger, maybe a better rate HELOC, because the equity in my property did not disappear as I was eliminating debt. It doesn't just ra magically disappear. If my home decreases in large amounts, and we're talking 100, 200,000 plus dollars, there's a different conversation going on. We're buying guns and ammo at that point, okay? Like civil war broke out. Like you're not thinking about, oh my God, is my HELOC gonna be frozen? You're thinking about guns, ammo, food storage, you know, allies with the neighbors, because if the property of your home decreases by multiple six figures, you know that something else globally or on the news is, is happening. It's not just, you're not just in your neighborhood and all of a sudden your home loses $300,000 worth of valuation and that was your HELOC gap. You know what I'm saying? Like there's steps to this. Yep, so absolutely. We're, absolutely. Creating, we're creating scenarios that just haven't happened right? Or right. even if they did, I'm, I promise you, that's not going to be your concern. Like right. you're, you're, you're looking at something else right now. And then when that storm passes then we go back, right? So there's these things where it's like, yeah, this, this, this is risk. This is risk. That's risk. But I've evaluated it. This still makes sense for me. I like having liquidity. I'm a good steward. I'm good at all these things. And so you've eliminated risk. Right. right. And I think there, there's so much I would like to, to say on that, but in, I'll be brief and just say, first of all, the question, as you point out, is as compared to what? As compared to what? There's no perfect strategy. We're not saying that this is perfect and has no right. drawbacks, but is it better than the alternative? Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and then also when people are presented with this strategy, they or some people anyway, they immediately run to all these worst case scenarios. And yeah. okay, I'm not saying we shouldn't consider worst case scenarios, but why don't you have all these questions and objections when we're talking about a 401k, right? Or an IRA or putting money into the S&P 500, right? All these worst case disaster scenarios would blow up just about any of those strategies and you'd probably be worse off, right? They only bring up these worst case disaster scenarios when they're presented with an unconventional idea, because in my opinion, many of them are just looking for an excuse to dismiss an unconventional idea and embrace the conventional wisdom because that's easier, right? That's easier. Absolutely. What is the value of liquidity and how do we eliminate risk through, if I know what my options are and I'm diligent and I'm a good steward, then I'm, I'm just not going to have these problems that most people have, period, right? Mm -hmm. I'm in a position right now in my own finances where I have a first lien HELOC. I have all this liquidity. Something happens. Okay, I know what to do next. If my HELOC gets frozen, I know what to do next. I have all these other things set up that I'm going to be just fine. That even in a worst, 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 worst case scenario, obviously we can't predict the unforeseen. But as a producer, as an optimistic person, future looks bright. 
I'm going to figure out a way out of it. I may not be able to prove it to you on paper, but I'm going to have that confidence that I'm going to get my family out of this particular situation, especially if it was an outside force coming in to attack my homeland, my personal financial economy. If the global economy affects my personal economy, I have enough wherewithal, contacts, connections, network, relationships, credibility, reputation to pivot and recover and thrive. All right, so when crisis hits, and I have a lot of videos on my channel for those that are watching that talks about velocity banking in a crisis, how to operate in a crisis, how to thrive in a crisis, so that it goes beyond the strategy of just leveraging debt to pay off debt, but it really pours into the mindset of what does it take to create velocity and understanding how banking works in your life, right? So with that- Understanding how banking works. That's so true because so many people don't understand how banking works, but they think they do because if, if you say, do you know what a bank is? They'll say, yeah, yeah, I know what a bank is. There's a bank right up the street from me, right? Okay, do you know what the bank is doing with your money? And even if they do, the other problem is the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper names. Modern banks are not banks, not in the traditional sense of that word. Right. What we're doing with infinite banking and velocity banking is a lot closer to what real, actual sound banking. And so people think we're talking about HELOCs in the case of velocity banking, or they think we're talking about whole life insurance in the case of infinite banking. Right. They get caught up in the particular tool that we're using because they do not understand banking. Mm -hmm. Once you understand banking, then you understand, you mentioned several like credit card, HELOC, PLOC, business line of credit, right? Firstly, or secondly, in ELOC, whole life insurance, like all of these are tools that can be used to help us reclaim the banking function for ourselves. And so the challenge for most people is not that they don't understand velocity banking or infinite banking or HELOCs or whole life insurance, it's that they don't understand banking. Correct. And being in a debt-based society, another really just eye-opening thing here that I've learned over the years is debt is tax-free it comes at a cost which is the interest rate many times the cost is way less than what the taxable expense would be if you received the capital in a, in a different way exactly and and i think exactly. this is the world you know stepping into real estate that's that's where this becomes very very advantageous you hear people like grant cardone talk about things like this and many others mm -hmm. but in in just your own personal economy being able to turn your home into a checking account that has liquidity and then being able to use those funds efficiently and effectively over a period of time to solve for a particular need. For example, you know, looking at the person's 401k, let's say, or their retirement accounts, maybe allowing that 401k or these other retirement accounts to, to remain compounding for a little bit more, allow those to accumulate for a little bit more, let's just say, and you can tap into the equity in your property at four to six, seven percent cost while doing velocity banking based on your income and expense and cash flow. And let's just say in retirement, you're 65, 67 years old, you've retired, you've got two social securities, husband and wife, maybe a pension, maybe an annuity, something paying out. And let's just say you're still short about a thousand dollars or so. Well, with all those incomes, the two annuities, pension, annuity, whatever, whatever you got, and let's say you have a, a 401k and or you have some other kind of self-directed Roth, some type of investment account that you would like to keep growing. You don't want to start pulling in income from it right away. It would be cheaper to say pull from the equity in your property and your your HELOC, your say your first lien or second lien, your home could be a buffer volatility vehicle to protect other assets and allow them to continue to compound and appreciate without having right. the tax liability and the expense of drawing and cutting off compounding interest. So it's yep. like yep. a it's, totally yep. different ballgame. As, right? as compared to what? As compared to what? Yeah, you're paying interest when you borrow against your house. That's true. Mm -hmm. But what are the alternatives? And oftentimes you find the alternatives are more expensive to your point because now you're paying, you're not paying 8% interest on the HELOC, but you're paying 25% in taxes. Or now you have to draw, you have to draw down from an investment account early. And so you're not, a, you're not getting the 12% returns that you would have gotten. Yeah. Right. So we have to look at it in the, in your overall financial picture. Like as an example, if we looked at the mortgage in isolation, we could say, 
well, you should throw all your income into the mortgage and pay it down as fast as possible because then you'll reduce your interest costs. Well, that's true. But if you took that money you were throwing at the mortgage and put it somewhere else, what could you do? It, right. I think you'll find in most cases, if you now I'm just talking about a mortgage, mm -hmm. but with any debt, right? If it's a reasonable, non toxic form of debt, it may not make sense to pay it down any faster, right? Because you can deploy your money elsewhere, right? And not only that, I really value liquidity. I've had this experience recently where I, I took out a couple of personal loans because I, because I work with people and I coach sometimes on these strategies, I do it myself and I play around with debt more than I would recommend for the average person. I could pay off these personal debts anytime I want to. And so I'm paying more in interest out of pocket than I otherwise would if I paid them off. But you know what, Denzel? I value liquidity above everything else. So yeah. the way I view it is I am paying some in interest in order to get extra liquidity. Because if I pay off those personal loans, that money's now gone. I don't get it back, right? And yes, I paid less in interest, but now I don't have the liquidity. So uh, I'm totally fine paying more in interest if it means I get more liquidity. I'm totally fine with that trade-off, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas I did pay off my HELOC because I don't lose access to that liquidity. The line of credit is a two-way street. Nice. Um, do we have time for one more objection? Yeah, I can honestly go all day with this, dude. <laughs> so, and I'm going to chop this up into multiple videos so we can go right into the next comment. And this will so here he's be kind of multiple videos. Yeah. So let me sure the screen. So go ahead. He, here he's kind of agreeing with us. So he's, he's, uh, he's being pretty reasonable. He said HELOCs work better for some people because of intangible psychological factors. For example, it motivates them to act and address their debt. This is probably the strongest argument for velocity banking. If people are willing to act, even though it costs them more, it is their choice. If this is the way they want to manage their debt, even if it is less cost efficient, okay, I might question that. Yes, I agree with you. It is still better than doing nothing. I would almost say that in reverse, that if they're using a different strategy to pay down debt that's less effective than velocity banking, if they're doing it and they're motivated to do it, then that's a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. And to that last part, even if it's less efficient, yes, I agree with you. Let's let's go with that. Let's say it is less efficient velocity banking over extra payments. Then the only reason why that person should still move forward with velocity banking, even though it would say take you longer to get out of debt, the value of liquidity then pops up. So taking it to the whiteboard here for a second, understanding that yes. you've got more options. Optionality. Yep. Yeah, you said more options. I love that word, option, because that's what liquidity gives you, optionality. Correct. You Correct. have options. Right. You have options. So you pay if you pay off all your debt, but now you have no savings, well, now, now you're kind of almost in a, you're in a worse situation, in my opinion. Right. Let's say we're dealing with someone that has $1,500 a month in cash flow. They're doing extra payments. What what no Excel spreadsheet will typically account for unless it's a software is when is this person actually making this extra payment and on what? It's a mortgage that they're making this extra payment of $1,500. And let's say the mortgage payment is more than their cash flow per month, right? So the the regular payment is $2,500. They're making an extra $1,500 payment. So total, they're sending every month $3,500. In the event, there is a unexpected life event. Something happens. Crisis, whatever it may be. Right, and we, and we all know, Denzel, these things only happen to people who are doing velocity banking. They people who are following the standard correct. strategy never, never have that happen to them. Correct. If you're doing a 401k and a mortgage, <laughs> that never happens to you. Uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> all day long, right? So, so watch this. The person's doing extra payments. Most people are making the extra payment at the end of a month. Most people, because... They're evaluating all their expenses. They, they saw, okay, everything's paid. What's left over my checking account? I have about $1,500. I got about $1,497. I got about $1,501. I got $1,431 in, in money left over. And they go ahead and make that extra payment toward their mortgage because at, at the end of the month, so at the beginning of the month, they're getting a paycheck. Most people cannot, they, they don't like seeing their account go to zero, their checking account. So they right. may, they may right. not ever really, you know, they're projecting a cash flow of $1,500, but they're, 
but they're not really ever making the $1,500 on the dot payment. It's usually an odd number, right? And it's usually at the end of a month, right before they get the next paycheck so that they know that they can still pay their bills the following month. Now, as it relates to making this extra $1,500 payment, typically what I've seen and what clients have told me, because I'm, I'm not speaking from experience, I've never had a mortgage before. I only have a first thing HELOC, so I can't speak from experience. So working with clients and hearing what they've said, that when they make this $1,500 payment, sometimes the mortgage institution holds on to the 15 until this is paid. So if you have like the due date, it's June 12th, we're recording right now. If they make this $1,500 payment on June 12th, June 1st, they made the payment, right? And let's say, I don't know, the, 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 the next statement cycle comes after the 12th, then maybe the $1,500 would be applied immediately as principal. But mm -hmm. if the statement already came out for July 1st, and you make the $1,500 payment at the end of a month, at the end of June, that $1,500 may not go to principal right away because right. this this has to get paid first. So either your 15 is gonna get applied to this 25 and then you make the extra payment afterwards. So that creates a discrepancy in your Excel spreadsheet. That slows you down. A lot of people don't realize that. So when I'm talking to clients, I often tell them when you go to make an extra payment or a chunk payment with Velocity Banking, you need to call that in and actually make sure it's going to principal, right? And you need to ask if they'll even process it as principal or if they hold on to it until this gets paid. Until that gets I just, paid, yeah. you're paying interest. I, I just have to pause and say I love the fact that we're talking about things that have immediate practical consequences for people. We're not talking like your standard financial advisors. Well, it's like, give me some money. And then hypothetically, five years down the road, depending on what the market does, which who knows what that's going to be, right. maybe it'll work out. And if there's a crash, well, I'll just shrug my shoulders and say, hey, it's the market. What can you do? Just wait for it to recover. No, we're helping you with things that you need help with that will give you immediate, concrete, practical results. We're helping you pay off your largest debt your housing payment will help bring you to apply that payment in the most efficient manner. I just love this. We can give people concrete results immediately, right? Absolutely. That's why I love what we do. I love what we do. Yeah. We actually help people. There's nothing hypothetical about this, right? This is no. practical. And there's high-end softwares out there that exist. I, I promote one of them in the marketplace, but there are softwares that exist that will help you determine, let's just say you're doing no velocity banking, we can add velocity to your debt snowball strategy without doing quote unquote velocity banking with a line of credit. If we understand how your mortgage actually works and we understand how your income comes in and your expenses go out, we can customize how you live to make that $1,500 payment at the right time, the most efficient time. And the general rule is the earlier you make that $1,500 payment, the, the faster you obviously would get out of debt, right? But that's not the case for majority of people. They're waiting. Sometimes they wait past a full month to see the cash flow there. Some people will also extract $500 at a time out of their paycheck, right? Or a couple hundred dollars and it goes into a savings. And then from there, once they see it go to 15, then they make the payment to the mortgage. Whereas you can make an argument for doing multiple payments to your mortgage before you get to the 15. So again, there's a lot of manual labor in how you're just doing snowball, making extra payments. And I'm, I promise you, your Excel is assuming that the payment got applied immediately when you clicked pay. And that's not how it works. You make a $1,500 right. extra principal right. payment, it takes multiple days for it to process, even if it processes as a principal payment. Sometimes it processes as interest and principal, right? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it gets held, right? You, you don't know that, or most people don't know. They're just sending a payment in. Oh, I made extra payment. Don't even realize it's not actually doing the damage it could have done when it was on a, say, a first lien HELOC. You see, when mm -hmm. we make payments in our first lien HELOCs, or even in a second lien HELOC, it is instantaneous deduction. In principle instantaneous mm -hmm. every single time until the actual due date is the only time we pay interest 
And guess what? The interest gets extracted from the equity in the property. So it's not like I have to come up with more money. It, a huge it, it, psychological it, it's like, benefit whoa. of of the first lien HELOC strategy mm -hmm. that, that the way we with the products we use is that it's automated. You don't have to consciously do anything. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And um, DeAndre Clayton kind of pointed this out. And he says, you know, Wall Street understands the power of automation. That's why they automatically take your money away from you into their into their 401k. <laughs> they do it automatically and you never even see the money, right? Because they know the average person probably won't commit to contributing a certain percentage to their retirement account every month if it's not just automatically withheld. Yeah. So Wall Street gets your money by default. That's pretty big benefit to them. <laughs> IRS, gets, IRS gets your money by default. How do you, if you're so adamant on paying off your mortgage, how do you create automation in that? And you could make an argument that a first lien HELOC or second lien HELOC or a line of credit for that matter in general will solve for that in a more efficient way, despite what the interest rate may be on the tool itself. Okay. Not to say that the rate doesn't matter. I'm right. not going to, I'm not going to play that game. Right. I know others do. In the velocity banking world because it, it now it becomes marketing the rate doesn't matter because of how you're using the tool you're never going to pay what that rate is that is a half truth that's true but you still right, have to run right, the math right. you still have to run the math and right. say okay if it's a 15 percent heloc and even though i'm not right. gonna pay if it charges a, yeah what, what am it, i paying yeah, in here yeah. am i paying nine yeah. paying ten like what a, is a, a reductio ad absurdum right if it's a one percent mortgage versus a one thousand percent heloc right it's like <laughs> yeah the one thousand percent is only simple interest that's true but uh yeah you yeah. unless you're talking about over like a millennia <laughs> you know exactly the the one percent mortgage would probably win that battle this this isn't gospel what i'm gonna what i'm about to say but typically when your debt tool is two and a half to three times the rate that you're trying to pay off, it will absolutely most likely not make sense for the duration of you eliminating that debt. So let's say you had a 10% home equity line of credit and you have a 3% mortgage loan. And if we're at the very, very beginning of that mortgage loan, you're only a year in, two years in, you're at the top, then there's probably gurus out there that would say that 10% HELOC is not that big of a deal compared to the to the 3% mortgage. But I would then say, sure, let's say your math on your spreadsheet proves that that's not the case, that 10% is not more than three in that context. Let's say we ran with that. It will definitely not make sense after so many chunks. At some point, we have to either improve the HELOC rate, get a lower rate, or cut off velocity banking, like stop, because you've gotten such a lead, right? You made multiple chunks, so now you're ahead of snowball strategy, the guy that's just making extra payments. Now that you have your lead, don't lose it by forcing and keep pulling 3% to 10, 3% to 10. That's a great point. At some point, stop, drop, don't roll, but let's just let's just go back to making extra payments because you already got yeah, the lead. that's a great You're already point. a year and a half two years ahead of, of the snowball guy maintain your lead just make extra payments right yeah and you'll have just to, to show off. we're yeah just to show we're not it's not mortgage versus heloc that's oversimplifying things right that's not what we're talking right. about we're talking about velocity banking How do you think and what is the it? most yeah what is the most effective and efficient overall strategy which might involve a mortgage right correct if you're a year away from paying off your mortgage just Pay it off. Right? Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got a lady right now is going back and forth with, she's got like 18 grand, 20 grand left on her mortgage. I'm like, the only reason why we should go and get a first lien HELOC right now to pay that off is for liquidity purposes. That's it. Right. Other right. than that, you literally have the cash to wipe this out or just make extra payments. It's going to get done in the same amount of time. The only difference is with the first lien, you're immediately putting yourself in the liquidity event and giving yourself the ability to go invest, go create more cash flow if that is your desire. If that's not your desire and you just want to be done with this and have your $1,000 back in cash flow on that mortgage, then we can just simply take the next couple of months, six months, 12 months, if that, and, and be done with this thing with extra payments. And, and you're going to feel happier. And then if you want a first lien HELOC afterwards, it's not like, it's not like it, we lost the opportunity to get a first lien HELOC. We can, we can still go get it.
right? Right, right. Or, or yeah. Well, it's kind of like have to get a first lien. Just just do um, like a second lien without having to refinance the property. So you could also make an, an argument that you know, hey, getting a first lien HELOC, the closing costs, the refinance fees, the third party fees would be all too much if I just simply pay off this mortgage first and then go get a HELOC. My closing costs could be almost nothing, right? And that's a good argument to make, right? Especially if you're in like New Jersey or New York where closing costs might cost you 10 grand on a first lien HELOC refinance versus a different state might only be like 3000 bucks. Okay. So we also have to factor that in. Right. Uh, so again, like how do these things come together to really benefit you and we can get out of the, the mindset of this versus that, how do, right. how do we do this and that, how do we create more right. and assets with what we're doing here? Shout out to Caleb with his book called the end asset. Like, that mindset of and I can do this and that I can do this strategy and this oh my right. goodness yes you can wow come together makes you feel better it's That's sort of it. like when they when they do the uh, Peter Nelson and I talk this about this a lot they start comparing whole life insurance to an investment it's like oh boy here we go it's here. not there those two are not in competition <laughs> um what else you got for me? Okay. HELOC advantages. You Oh, I got plenty more. Don't worry. <laughs> we can write an encyclopedia here. You say that the advantage of HELOC is that it is a reserve of money that can be used in case of emergencies. Again, fair enough. All right. So he's conceding that point. However, the cost of this reserve is quite high. Again, over $5,000 just for the first year. That's He's referring to this specific video. I don't know if that number is accurate, but if the person needs such a reserve and there is nothing keeping them from having a HELOC, not using it except for emergencies and instead paying extra on the mortgage and thus saving the extra interest due on the HELOC. Note if the person uses the reserve that increases his interest cost, his total debt, and therefore delays the eventual repayment of his HELOC slash mortgage. I have to jump in here. It's like, okay, increasing his interest costs. Well, compared to what? But what if I use that HELOC to buy an investment property? I'm increasing my interest costs, but you can't look at that in isolation. What if I'm increasing my interest costs because I pull from my HELOC and I buy an investment property that now gives me cash flow? And so now I'm coming out way ahead. You can't look at just one thing in isolation. Right. Another advantage you cite for the HELOC is automation. Well, it is possible to automate extra mortgage payments as well, but in any case, an extra mortgage payment is an operation to be done once a month, which requires just a few minutes, so it is not that complicated. And if you miss a month of extra payment, it is not a big deal. It would just cost you about $10 of interest for that month. So I don't know, is there is there anything you want to respond to there, Denzel? Yeah, absolutely. So looking at, let's discuss the the other in that example there where it's like the increasing the HELOC cost, increasing my cost for having a reserve, right? Mm -hmm. What we're not saying, what I, what, I, what I think people get lost is, if you have savings, then you have savings. I'm not taking away mm -hmm. from anyone that says has savings. Let's say mm -hmm. you, you have three to six months, whereas most Americans don't. Let's say you do, you have three to six months worth of expenses, but but a life event occurs that would drain your savings. Right. And once again, life events only happen to people who are doing velocity banking. Right. It never happens to anybody else. And exactly. So let's say there's a life event that occurs and you need more capital and you ran out of savings and you have investment account, you have your normal income coming in and you have your whatever your positive cash flow is. Let's say this life event drains your, your savings. It's draining your cash flow. You now need money. Like you need money now. Either you're gonna pull from your retirement account, capital, 10K, 15K, 20K, whatever it is. Let's do in thousand dollar increments, okay? Uh, what, what, what state are you in? Virginia right Virginia. now. Virginia. Let's look up income tax rate in Virginia. What is the tax rate in 2024? Federal, so let's see, Virginia state income tax range from two to 5.75%. So that's, and then what would be the total? Probably gotta go to IRS, right? Tax rate, so for a single taxpayer, 22% around 44,000, 24% at 95, 32 at 182. Let's say when you factor in state, federal, da da da, all the tax together, we're at around 30%. Okay. So on every thousand that we pull out of the um, 
retirement account, there's two things that happen. You stop compounding on whatever you withdrew. And, and let's that say, cost never never stops. <laughs> correct. So let's say you, you were compounding at 9%. You withdraw 1,000. For every 1,000, you're going to have a 30% hit. That's $300. Law, you have to you have a cost of 300 to pull a thousand out of this retirement account. You lost nine percent compounding, so you missed out on ninety dollars. Year so, one, year one. So that's one whole year, three hundred and ninety dollars for every thousand. Eight point five percent prime HELOC rate right now. Could be higher, could be lower. Prime is eight and a half. I take a thousand out over one year. I just pay eighty five dollars. I kept my ninety. Yep. So. However many more thousands I pull, that number increases, obviously. Obviously, this number increases, but it costs less to borrow than it does for the 65-year-old, the 59-year-old, the retired yep. person to pull from here, right? So important. This is such an important point. This right? blew my mind. Like, when I discovered everyone's this, like, oh, yeah, my goodness. I don't want to borrow because it costs me money and interest. It's the seen versus the unseen. Correct. One of the things I love... Again, the intangible benefits, right? About velocity banking and infinite banking is it turns a hidden cost into a visible cost. I would argue there's a tangible psychological benefit to the fact that you see the interest you pay on a policy loan when you borrow against whole life. You see the interest you pay on a HELOC. So you can see and you can measure your costs and you feel the pain of it, which is good. Whereas when you pull from an investment account or you pay cash for something rather than borrowing, you're, there's still a lot of other costs, but they're now hidden. And so you're not seeing, well, what could I have earned on that money uh -huh. if I had just saved it? And maybe I'm just earning 4%. Well, 4% compounded over a few years is not an insignificant chunk of change, right? So velocity banking allows you to keep your compounding money compounding and not interrupt it. Correct. And this example here of paying $85 assumes the user took a thousand and did nothing, right? Right. No velocity. Right. When you right. when you add velocity banking in here, the person that takes a thousand out of their HELOC, however many thousands we take out, say it's 10,000, 15,000, whatever it is, uh -huh. they're still making money. They still have expenses. They still have cash flow. So when all of that gets parked into the HELOC, we now reduce 85 to maybe in the 40 to 60 cost range per month or less, depending on how much we pulled out. But you can cut your eight and a half can be cut to four, to three, to five in net interest for the year, however long we, we go. And then when you allowed your money to keep compounding, you could even strategically run the math to say, okay, if I'm compounding at nine at this and it's this number, and if I can keep my costs below what I'm earning over here, then it's right. as if, it's as if I didn't. It didn't cost me anything. It's as if it, there was a cost. You'll see it extract right. that of your account, but it's as right. if I recaptured it over over here by not stopping the compounding event. And then and then the life event is over, right? It's done. And when it came to borrowing, where most people will borrow in the event they need money, where do they typically pull from? Their credit card, and they don't know how to use it properly, or they get a loan from Prosper, Lending Tree. It's whoever. And what if you? What if you can't their qualify? Mailbox, right? Like exactly. people assume they can just they can just get it. Well, if you're dealing with a negative life event, you may not be credit worthy. Maybe you lost your job. You have yep. no income. How are you going to qualify for a line of credit? Yep. You need to secure those debt instruments while times are good. Yes. Because as the saying goes, a bank is a place that will give you a loan once you prove you don't need it. Right. Yeah. So. To get access to those debt instruments while times are good, while you have income and you're credit worthy, because then when times are bad, you'll have access, you'll have secured your access already, um, and you may not be able to qualify. And the same thing is true with whole life insurance, by the way, with infinite banking. Right. Take out a convertible term policy for your full human life value with a company that has a competitive whole life product and do it yesterday. Denzel, how would you feel living in a $3 million home if you made $100,000 a year and you had no homeowner's insurance? Yeah, not good. Not going to feel good at all. So if you're going to fully insure your house and you're going to fully insure your car, don't you think you should 
fully ensure your life? Like what's more important to your family? Absolutely. I'd rather, I'd rather have it, not need it, need it, you know, need it. Right. And it needs to be, the the point is it needs to be, yeah, exactly. It needs to be a convertible term policy because that protects your insurability. Mm -hmm. If you just have standard term, let's say you're five years into a 10 year term policy and you have some health event happen. Okay. Or maybe a health event happens to one of your family members. That'll affect your rating, right? Yeah. And now you can't get life insurance anymore. Now you, you, your term expires and that's it. You have no options. Getting back to that word, optionality. Mm-hmm. If you have convertible term policy, you have options. Five years in, something happens to your health, you still have the guaranteed right to convert that to permanent coverage. I know I'm changing subjects, from that, but well, I think there's, there's always it. an analogy, right? There's yeah. a parallel. And I'm trying to tie it back to velocity banking to that point of of self insuring, in a way, a HELOC by leveraging debt, which debt is tax free. You could make the the connection. Not only is it tax free, it's tax deductible in some cases too. Yes, you can make the connection there to say that I'm I'm insuring my compounding by having access to these debt tools. So I insure my home, I insure my car, I insure my life. Let's say you do all these things. And when it comes to creating lifetime income with your retirement accounts, social security, all these different things, when those come up short for a period of time and you're stuck between, do I pull from a retirement account now with the risk that that money might run out later? Do I tap into my insurance, so to speak, my HELOC, Mm -hmm. my debt tool, as a liquidity product that only costs this much and allows my money to keep compounding at whatever rate that I'm getting and it creates an offset event and it's as if I didn't lose in the process and when we attach velocity banking to that pull, that draw, you pull that extra thousand out in increments of when you need it, right? And you do velocity banking to quickly eliminate it, right? Even if you're running a negative cash flow, you would reduce the interest cost, right? Because money was parked for a period of time where you didn't owe a thousand for right. fifteen days. It was like eight hundred, eleven hundred, nine hundred, a thousand, right? It kept going up and down, up and down. Your money compounded where you needed it to be, and now you can draw, say, more from that, or you roll over that money into it, right? So you take the profits, roll it over into annuity, pays out that that gap. You know that your social security or pension did not cover right there's so much to this that we can you know dive into and have so many options it's such yeah man yeah. it's such a mind-blowing point i i agree with you uh i could i'm getting excited listening to you there's so much we could think do about that because when we talk about velocity banking plus infinite banking that's where i get so excited because those strategies are so complementary but to return to the subject at hand before I derail this, because I love infinite banking and I love talking about it. Um, let's see, where was the one? I'm sorry. And I'd love to I mean, see it again. maybe another comment from uh, maybe someone else. Oh, yeah, that was it. Okay, that was it. Okay. Oh, from someone else? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, some of the other comments are maybe more perhaps, not as, or... perhaps not as kind <laughs> and shareable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um there is another guy. Yeah, let me pull him up. Um, there is definitely another guy who's been commenting. Um, it will take me a minute to get to his uh, comments. That's okay. Um, All this stuff gets edited, so we're clean. Okay. Yeah. This guy, his his, uh, his screen name is Confused. Oh, it's on this one. My best performing video, believe it or not, is a first lean HELOC video. Okay. Okay. Now, this is one that... Uh, 10 replies. Okay. This is one that uh, DeAndre and I have already addressed in detail, but perhaps it, I think this is an important point. Okay. So he's talking about, um, so this is, uh, his name is Confused. I think that's perhaps an apt screen name, but your premise that the mortgage uses amortized interest versus the HELOC using simple interest is factually incorrect. Amortized interest doesn't exist. There's simple interest and compound interest. Mortgages and HELOCs calculate interest the same way. Search the internet to verify what I have said is true. Okay, second, you can make extra payments to the principal on a mortgage at any time. That will actually reduce the interest part of your next payment. Third, interest rate definitely matters. Higher interest rates results in higher interest costs. Sorry, that is just how math works. And then, yeah, then he starts yelling at me. But, but you know, his second and third point, I don't really object to. Yeah, you can make extra payments to the principal. And yeah, that will reduce the interest part. Yep. And interest rate does matter. No one's saying interest rate doesn't matter. It does matter. That's true. All things being equal, lower interest rate is better, but all things are not equal. But this first point I think is important. So amortized interest 
versus simple interest versus compound interest. He's yeah. kind of saying we're we're creating an artificial distinction here, and really HELOCs and mortgages calculate interest the same way. So do you want to address the difference between simple interest, amortized interest versus compound interest, and what is the significance of those differences yep. as it pertains to velocity banking? Yeah, this was an area that I myself had to improve in. So before I dive into that, I'd love to understanding of it. Would you say that amortized interest, simple interest are, are different things? Are they the same thing? Do you agree with him on that point, that they're the same thing? Or... No, I think that, yeah, no, I think they're different. And okay. the way that DeAndre Clayton explained it is what matters is the passage of time. There is such a thing as simple interest, but it only exists for a time frame. There is no such thing as infinite simple interest. So what that means is simple interest to me means the interest doesn't get added to the principal if you don't pay it, but it only exists for a time frame. Right. So for your typical first scene HELOC, you're going to have a 10 year now, actually, some of them have 30 year, but let's just say a 10 year draw period during which time you have simple interest. After that 10 year draw period, then it becomes amortized. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, whole life insurance. You take out a policy loan. It's simple interest on that policy loan. If you don't pay any interest for a year, Com that interest then gets added the next year. Right. And then it compounds. So simple interest is different. Right. And then amortized means the, the schedule of interest is preset. When you look at an amortization table, right? It'll tell you with each payment, here's how much principal you pay. <clears throat> here's how much interest you pay. And you can accelerate that schedule some by paying extra principal payments. That's true. Mm -hmm. But but you still are on that same schedule, right? Logan, I'm impressed. This is good. So I really, I really, <laughs> Thank you. I really Thank like you. what you said there because for many years, I myself, amortized interest, simple interest are two different things. That is a half truth. So just to correct the one thing there, what you're when we say when the velocity bank gurus and content creators say that amortized interest versus simple interest, it's a half truth. There is like a difference. You could say that while well, the words being used are different, as to declare a loan from a home equity line of credit, simple interest first ten years, and amortize later on, mortgage amortize the whole duration of thirty years. From that standpoint, true. As for how the interest is calculated. It's actually the same, right? Okay. So I learned uh, recently, it was more like this year and, and last year, and I kind of got confirmed this year, but I, I really sat down with a mortgage expert. And what he told me was amortization, to your point, is a form of payment. It's, it's, a, it's a duration of time. To DeAndre's point as well, giving him credit, like it's, it's about the time that gets passed. When Velocity Bank and Guru say something like, the interest on your mortgage is front-loaded, right? All mm -hmm. the interest is up front. And it's like, yes, you pay more interest in the early years of your mortgage. And by getting ahead of that would cancel it again, half truth, but that doesn't mean that the mortgage institutions or the banks are nefarious and doing an evil strategy of just front no, 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 interest no. at the beginning. And that's kind no, of no. how we, we paint the picture. <laughs> that's how we paint the picture. Just so you know, the landscape of velocity banking, gurus is there a lot of them have not figured out or they're just in their own echo chambers where they made amortization to be the enemy and simple interest is your best friend and not realizing that they're technically the same thing so to to recap here amortized interest simple interest is the same thing the only thing in life is simple and compounding and then amortization is a form of payment but it still doesn't negate what the velocity banking gurus and and content creators have been saying is that yes, if we can acquire a line of credit revolving simple interest and it's not compounding, it's just simple interest those first 10 years and you have the option with these lines of credits to pay principal first, interest on the due date or principal and interest each and every time that you make a payment. So there's a lot of flexibility in, in how interest gets calculated. When you're on a fixed amortized mortgage loan, all of the interest has been assumed for the duration of that loan. It's it's assumed, it's laid out. It lets you know, you get that 30th year amortization schedule, you'll know exactly how much interest you'll pay each and every month if you just make the, the regular old payment. Inside of a home equity line of credit, you have the ability to make these lump sum payments to that mortgage 
and effectively accelerate the timeline of that amortization because you've applied principle. So you you just canceled interest and you rerouted a portion of that interest. Now it's up to you, Velocity Banking Strategy, to make sure that we do not overpay compared to what you took out of that amortization loan. So that, that was something that I struggled with and I think a lot of people still get confused and I've made content to improve over time saying, look, I'm no longer playing the battle of amortization versus simple interest because they're technically the same thing. What we're, what we need to hone in on more is time pass, right? And understanding where are we in your amortization loan? If we're within the first five years of that amortized loan, whether it's a two or a 6% mortgage, the way they set up the payment with these banks typically whether it's 2%, whether it's three, whether it's four, five, six, you're always gonna pay roughly two and a half times the original uh, purchase price of the home. So it's like, it yeah, doesn't, it doesn't yeah. matter if it's two, it doesn't matter if it's six, it's like you're always gonna pay at least two and a half times, more, more than likely, of of the home over that 30 year duration. So now- But the, 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 but the payment schedule is rigid. Correct. With the numbers, meaning that, you know, you have a, let's say it's a $2,000 monthly payment. No matter how much you pay in principal, you still have that two thousand dollar monthly payment due right. until the whole thing is paid off. Exactly. Whereas with block, it's an interest only payment, and if you dump a bunch of principal in, your required payment goes down. Correct. Which that doesn't happen. With which amortized. means more cash flow or more money going to principal consistently. So, right. in the world of velocity banking, here's another sort of uh, uh, argument that the person that says that the rate doesn't matter, another half truth here, but you could make a strong argument that the interest rate on the HELOC almost doesn't matter. When you when you line up someone that, let's say Logan buys a home for 600K, mortgage, 6%, then Zell buys a $600,000 home, first lien, 9.5%. Logan has a lower rate. Zell has a higher rate, nine and a half. Logan's payment on 600K is probably like $4,000 or something and some change, right? My payment is 600,000 times 9.5% divided by 12. That's going to be my payment. So my whole paycheck, let's say Logan and I both make the same amount of money. You can make the argument that I can most likely get out of debt faster than Logan because chances are my closing costs were cheaper than his instead of going right. with the, the origination fees and loan fees. So chances are my cost to get in was cheaper. So now I'm ahead out the gate. And mm -hmm. you can also make the argument that when life events occur and things happen, he has to stop. Logan has to stop paying off his mortgage to handle that life event. I kept paying down my mortgage. I pulled from the equity, handled the life event and kept going. There was no delay in, in pay down. Whereas Logan has a delay. He now has to kind of, okay, life just happened. All right, this happened. Okay, let me get back into it. What's my cash flow? All right, at the end of the month, I'll make a payment of this month. He now has to remind himself to make that payment. Whereas Denzel, it's like money's coming in, expenses are going out, cash flow positive, interest gets swiped. And the, the amount of interest that I'm paying on principal each and every month goes down faster than Logan's consistent $4,000 payment, right? So that's where it's like the Again, the value of liquidity, like these immeasurable things start to stack up in my favor over, over mm -hmm. Logan's, right? Uh, but I still, you know, in my world, I'm still like, let's not just go with any HELOC. Let's find the best, right? And then right. let's incorporate sure. credit sure. cards and let's incorporate all these different things to, to improve it. Uh, but that's a big one, amortized versus simple. For everyone watching, it's the same thing. Release stress, okay? It's, it's basically <laughs> the same thing. They're simple and compounding. Those are your two different types of interest. Amortize is a form of payment. All we're looking to solve for is understanding the time that has passed. If you're at the tail end of that 6% mortgage, that 2% mortgage, and you go and get a 9% HELOC to try and accelerate, you're probably running bad math. It probably right, won't make right, sense. Once right. you see, is a, 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 again, not gospel, but like a general rule for me when I look at people's mortgages and stuff when principal and interest that's a, a first sign vb velocity banking may not so when your mortgage payment and you look at it and you see how much is going to principal and how much is going to interest when it's 50 50 dude you've already paid the bank 
a lot of profit, right? You've already, <laughs> they've already pretty much got their money back uh, almost at this point, and now they're in profit margin, right? When you see principal is above 50, you're in the 60, 70, and there's only like 30% going to interest, velocity banking will only typically make sense if the rate is equal or less than what the mortgage is, equal or less than, typically, right? This is when we're fighting over dollars and cents at this point, right? And, and when I work with my clients, I'm like, look, I'm not going to try and fight over dollars and cents. I'm not going to force this strategy to work in your favor, especially if you're a newbie, right? And you're just getting it going. Um, you might be at a point where we really maybe don't need to do velocity banking here on your mortgage. In fact, we might take velocity banking instead of paying off this mortgage that you have a fixed cost in of living. Maybe we leverage velocity banking to invest and say, this is how much you're paying in interest every month in a year. Do you think we could invest the cash flow that you were going to send to your mortgage? and possibly get a higher rate of return, not just higher than the rate on your mortgage, because that's also bad math, but it needs to be like double or, or triple. Could we get double or triple somewhere else or invest in your skill to increase your income and then have the option to pay off your mortgage in full via a check? You just write a check mm -hmm. in the same amount of time it would have taken you to pay this off by making extra payments. So let's say it was, let's say it was 3.5 years with um, extra, no velocity, right. three and a half years. You're like, oh, that sounds great. I'm 55, I'll be 58 and a half when this is all said and done, then I can retire right at 59. Great strategy. Or you might say, could I take that cash flow over the next three and a half years and triple my money, quadruple, 5X, 10X my money, and then write a check, boom, pay, home got paid off in the same amount of time, 58 and a half, and I have 4X more cash flow more more assets that's you know again that's still velocity banking so we didn't throw it out we we did and we did snowball and velocity in this example right maybe you maybe you sent an extra hundred dollar hundred dollars just to make you feel good at night you know an extra couple hundred bucks and you took the rest and invested it again back to my framework here it's like velocity banking that snowball i think work great together doesn't always make sense that snowball always makes sense. That snowball is a measurement for velocity banking success. Not every tool works. Look for the best terms. Don't force it. Always run the numbers, right? If the rate is, if the rate you're trying to pay off is higher than your debt tool, most likely an automatic win right there, right? And there's, you know, back to discipline, stewardship, these different things. Dude, this make this, I get, I get fired up with this stuff. Getting on these calls with these clients, helping people, and just seeing, you know, their their energy explode through the phone, you know, or if it's a zoom, I see them light up and they smile and they get happy because they're like, wow, like, yeah, I, I can, I can see this. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's very, very clear. I know what this cost will be. And if life happens, I know how to handle it. Right. I remain liquid, effective. And it's just wonderful stuff here. What else you got for me? You got another one or no? Yeah. Uh, 